good morning. Good morning. You know, I know that uh, maybe um, you've looked at your uh, bifold and the notes. And it says I'm going through verse 16, but after studying this chapter and looking at it, I'm doing the whole chapter. Uh, you're just going to have to bear with me. We're not going to be much longer than normal, trust me. Uh, but I am going to do the whole chapter and still try and divide it up. Uh, so we're talking about God's judgment. That's what we're going to be looking at. I, I just want to, a couple of things, I just want to make sure you know this is about 30 years from chapter 4 to this point here. Um, and and Daniel's about 80 years old, okay, is, is where this time frame is. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm not going to read the chapter to start off with. I'll just read it as I go through the sermon in my scripture. You can just follow along with me and with that. So if you will pray with me. And we'll get started. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just, uh, just, just thank you for the ability to come and, and worship here. Lord, just uh, seeing those songs of praises and just how they touch my heart, being able to sing those songs. And Lord, being able to come and read scripture and, and, and pray. And it's just great to be in your house today. Lord, I, I thank you for the ability to, to bring this message. I know if it wasn't for you, I would not be able to do any of it. And I pray, God, that I can just get out of your way. That your words are spoken today and not mine. Lord, we can together just paint a picture of your son. Thank you for who you are and what you do. Just trust me in my prayer. Amen. A man went to the doctor for a checkup because he wasn't feeling good. He was feeling really bad, honestly. And, 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 and gets a bunch of test runs and the doctor finally comes back in and he says, i got some bad news. You're in pretty terrible shape. You're going to die in a month if things don't change. He says, you, what you need to do is you need to go home and tell your wife to cook more nutritious meals. You need to stop working like a dog every day. You also need to inform your wife that if you can't have stress in the budget, so you're going to have to do a budget, she's going to have to stick to it. And the kids, you just, she's going to have to keep them off your back. And whatever she has to do to, to help with those kids, they don't bother you, she's just going to have to do it. The guy sits there and looks at the doctor. He says, you know, Doc, if you don't mind, um, if you call my wife and tell my wife this, it would be more official coming from you than from me. She might take it a little bit better. Well, the fellow goes home and, his wife rushes to the door. She says, I'll talk to your doctor, honey. And I'm sorry you only got 30 days to live. <laughs> you know what? We do that to God sometimes. God's preference is to deal with humanity and love, and we want that humanity and love. But if we push God too far, He's going to deal with us. And He's going to deal with us in judgment. When God puts us on the, when God puts his glove with, judgment gloves on, let me tell you what, we're in for it. When, he, when he's going to judge, he's going to judge harshly. And I think there's, I mean, we all know there's a way of avoiding judgment is to understand how it works. And, you know, we know how God judges. We know who God judges. But, but we have the knowledge and understand that, that, that the way not to be judged is through Jesus Christ. That he is the only way. This precious scripture, we see there's a new king that sits upon the throne. This new king, his name is Bel Belshazzar. He is the grandson uh, of King Nebuchadnezzar, the son of Nabonius. And, and they, Nabonius had ruled for about 17 years, and then Belshazzar and Nabonius has ruled for 14 um, together. Um, you know, Babylon became a great empire under Nebuchadnezzar. It, it, was, it, it was the best, the greatest empire known to man. But after his death in 562 B.C., the empire began to deteriorate. There were four kings from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar. The first to succeed his father was Merodach, and he was very evil. Then came the Bash Marduk, who was basically a puppet king. And then Nabonidus. Uh, uh, who ruled the empire for 17 years. He was believed to marry one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, and he was the father of Belshazzar, who's here now. So this chapter is opened up with 
king vessels are given a, a, a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles, his wives, their wives and concubines. There's probably over 2,000 people there uh, at, at this party, and, and we see that, 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 that things are going to escalate out of hand, and we're going to see this is where you get the statement, the handwriting's on the wall. You can see that the handwriting's on the wall means that you know that that, that judgment's coming. And so that's 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 where we're that's where we're at. So let's dig into the scripture. Let's talk about um, talk about this a little bit. So verses one through four says, Thus is our the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Thus are tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem so that king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So we see that that that, that those are having this great party. Okay, it is uh, in fact going to be a party. It's not a banquet, you know. Um, it, it's a a lavish banquet. Um, anybody who was anybody was at that banquet. And the funny thing is, if you do some background reading on this, the Persian army is outside the gates laying siege to the city as they're having this banquet. You know what? Uh, Man, what boldness, what arrogance that this king had that he would throw a banquet while his city is being attacked by another army. I'm sure he thought he was invincible. I mean, he, they had massive 80 foot walls all the way around it. They, uh, they had lookout towers. They had bronze gates that just couldn't be battered down. They had a water supply with the Euphrates River, the Euphrates River running through the, through the city of Babylon. So, so they had supplies and they had Food and, and I'm sure he thought that they were invincible, you know, and, but he was really arrogant and bold to do this. Maybe it was because he wanted to build a morale up of, of the people in there. I don't know. But the army of Persia was definitely banging at their door while they're having this party. So the king and, and gets there, all the guests are there, and, and the wives and the concubine. Let me tell you what, this thing deteriorated quickly. I'm reading commentaries and, and things that, that this banquet, it was... It was a pretty wild place. And, and, and Belshazzar's up there drinking his wine, and he comes up with the thought of, man, how can I impress all these people? He says, I know what I'll do. So I'll go get these, the golden vessels, the, 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 the silver and the gold and, and all, these, all these vessels, and I'll bring them in, and we can drink wine out, out of the things that were taken from the temple there in Jerusalem when we invaded them. He says, and we can praise See praises to our to our gods, you know, uh, of, of silver and gold, and, and, and it just it, it, it would really, you know, lift up the spirits. And so they go and they get the cups. They start pouring wine in. They start drinking in them. But you know what? Nebuchadnezzar really didn't think about the consequences of blaspheming God. <coughs> You know, he overlooked the fact that these particular cups were sacred vessels of the Lord, the living and true God, that they were set apart for the use of God's service uh, of, uh, of, 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 with the priest and, and God's service alone. And so when they began the drinking from these cups, they were committing blasphemy against God. They, they were committing uh, adultery against God. They, they, they were guilty of drunkenness and immorality, you know, uh, against God. And they were just kind of not even caring and worrying about God. You, it, it, let me ask you a question. Was there ever, ever a time in your life when you just didn't care about God and you just went and did what you wanted to do? We see this here. This is what's going on. Now, I think this is why, why it's important that we, that we stay away from situations that's going to damage our immorality, that's going to damage on how we live. Uh, and I look at these things. You know, it doesn't always have to be a party. It can be whatever. Uh, that we give ourselves control to, whether it's a person, a substance, or, or, or a position that we make an idol out of. We, we cannot, we need to stay away from those situations. We, we need to try to live in, in, in the way that God wants us to do that. And we're 
strongly warned about that. Let me get verses 5 through 16. It says, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite of the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand and, and did the, that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints were slack and his knees began knocking together. And the king called out to bring in the conjurers, the tradillions, and the diviners. And the king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explanation and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. And all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known his interpretation to the king. The king Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler. And his nobles were perplexed, and the queen entered the banquet. Paul, because of the words of the king and his nobles, and the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you, or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illuminated insight and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And the king Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king appointed him the chief of a magician, conjurers, tradillions, and diviners. This was also because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solvings of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, and let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. And Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke to Daniel, Are you the Daniel who is the one of my exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah. Now I have heard about you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that, it, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read the inscription and make its interpretations known to me. But they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, and you're able to give interpretation and solve difficult problems. Now if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple, wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have the authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. So, we see that, that at that moment of blasphemy, at the moment that they're drinking the wine out of the sacred vessels, the, the ones that are set apart for God, that a, a human hand appeared with fingers and started writing on the wall. I imagine the mood probably turned pretty quickly, don't you? I mean, I think a, a crippling fear gripped the king and the guest. The merriment, the carousing, uh, it seized the, the, the dancing stomp. I imagine servants and, and, and attendants stopped in the tracks. The musicians, uh, musicians quit playing music. I imagine there was an eerie silence. Swept through that hall as everyone watched that hand write those four brief words on the wall. Can you imagine the silence? If I heard a pin drop, couldn't you? All of a sudden, I mean, it, 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 it just, nothing turned, and everybody's gripped with fear. The king definitely saw the worst. It says his knees started knocking. His face turned pale. I picture he passed out. He probably fainted. You know, he sees that. Uh, you know, whether he, he was caught or he hit the floor or whatever. You know, when he came to, he immediately started calling for his wise men. I need people in here right now to read what's written on the wall. To give me that interpretation. If anybody can interpret that, I'm going to put them to, to the number three ruler in the kingdom. Underneath me and my dad, they're going to be they're gonna be happy. Coat with purple. They're going to have gold necklaces. They're going to be able to, you know, tell people what to do. If anybody can do that, they're going to be raised to that position of authority. But none of them could. They couldn't even read the writing. They didn't even know what it was, you know. And he got a little bit more shaky, didn't he? Uh, with that, he he uh, even got a little bit more pale. A word had spread throughout the palace, 
of what was going on. Here comes mom to the rescue. Moms always come running to the rescue for their kids, don't they? I mean, you know, their kid needs something. Mom's the first one in line right there to say, what do you need? How can I help you? You know, they're there. That's what they do. And the queen mother comes running into the comes running into the into the room, looks at her son. She has some very stern words for him. I imagine she walked over to him, kind of leaned up to him, and she says, Stop it. Act like you're a king. Quit being like this. You're strong, you're capable, you need to step up and do what's right and quit being like this. Besides that, I know somebody. You know, I, I know a guy named Daniel. He was there when King Nebuchadnezzar was there, and he was able to interpret dreams, and he's able to do all these things. And you need to send for Daniel, because I know Daniel is going to be able to interpret these dreams. I know this guy, and he was he was the he was the the, 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 the lead wise man. Your grandfather trusted in him, and he could solve riddles and puzzles and do all that. You know? So without delay. He summoned Daniel. And once his identity was confirmed, he offered Daniel the same reward as everybody else. Now I believe this handwriting on the wall is a clear picture of guilty fear and the helplessness that we often, often feel. How many times do we feel like that, that when something happens that we that there's nothing that we can do? That we just have a have a have a fear and we have a helplessness. We feel like that we cannot do it. You know, there's times when, we, when things are going well, we don't always talk to God and turn to God and, and do that. But when, when something major happens, that's who we turn to, right? That, that's, who we, that's who we go after. You know, uh, whether it's a disease or financial difficulty or family problems, you know, sometimes we feel just feel hopeless and helpless. But we have a remedy for that. The only hope that we really have in this world is Jesus. That's, that's, who we, that's who we have. That's the only hope that we have in this world is Jesus Christ. And there's times that, that we got to turn to Him, turn to God, and, and help us through these things. And so I'm going to um, head on here, and we're going to finish up this chapter and start in verse 17. It says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the most high God, granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father, because of the grandeur which he bestowed on thee and all the peoples, nations, and men of every of every language, feared and trembled before him, whomever he walked, wished to wished he killed, and whomever he wished he spared alive, and whomever he wished to elevate, and whomever he wished he humbled. And when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was disposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. And he was driven away from mankind. And his heart was made like that of beast. And the dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. And he was given grass to eat like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind. And he sets over over it, whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, and you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand you lift your breath and your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Beni ni tekel up asharim. This is the interpretation of the message. Mean has God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the scales and found deficient. Perez kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. The Belshazzar gave orders that go Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issue a proclamation concerning him that he now has authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chedelian king, was slain 
So Darius to me received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So we see Daniel comes in, right? We see that, 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 that he comes in and the king says, I'm going to give you all these things that I promised everybody else. And Daniel, I can see Daniel looks at him and says, I don't want your stuff. I don't care about your treasures. I have some integrity. All I care about the, the treasure that I'm building up in heaven with God. These, these earthly things don't mean a thing to me. And, and besides that, and I think he, he, he kind of kind of let those are know. He says, you, you should know the God that you're dealing with. Your grandfather was a great man. And, and he became arrogant and proud and God humbled him and made him even greater than before. But you, you do not humble God. You, I can see Daniel saying, you're the one, you, you're the one who, who blasphemes God by drinking out of these sacred vessels. And don't humble your heart. Or let me tell you what. Let me tell you what this says. And you see the word mini, mini. It, it's double, okay? It, it, it's it's twice. And whenever it's in there like that, it, it means that 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 it's there for emphasis. Okay? And he says, God is watching. God is watching. He sees what you see or what you do. He sees what you say. We had to talk about this a little bit in our men's group yesterday, didn't we? You know, we talked about God knows all, sees all, sees everything. Those are our thoughts, even before we think and knows what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And so, so he's saying, look, God is watching you. God has been watching you. He sees the thing that, you, that you're doing right here. And, and man, let me tell you what. He knows. And then you see the word kill. And it means that you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting, found deficient. So God sees what you're doing. He has judged you and condemned you. You have been found deficient. You've been found wanting. And then he says, Perez, which means God's verdict is fine. So God is watching you. You have been found guilty, and his verdict is fine. And what Belshazzar did not know, when he, when Daniel was interpreting his dream, that the, that the Persian army was routing the Euphrates rivers a different way, and they were marching under the, under the walls on the riverbed, coming in, opening up the gates, and taking the city. While, while Daniel was doing that, we see that Belshazzar was slain at that point in time. And Darius the king took over. Now I think that writing on the wall has a message that is true for all of us. You know, the wise men weren't able to help the king. The words made no sense to them. You know, it, it, it really didn't make any sense to them at all. And, and we see that, 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 that that judgment is looming. And that judgment is for every single one of us. And so I got three things I want to talk about about God's judgment. Three things I want us to, want us to see about God's judgment. The first one is God's judgment is impartial. God's judgment is impartial. You know, um, in, in Romans chapter 2, it, it talks about the impartiality of God. If you read that whole chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but verses 11, verse 11 says, there is no partiality with God. Paul tells us that. And then in verse 16, he says, on the day according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So there is no partiality with God, and God's going to, going to judge our, our secrets, our secrets, because it, mean, it essentially means that, that God <coughs> doesn't show any favoritism. You know, no partiality. In, in Job chapter 34, verse 19, we see Job's friend, Elu, reveal the source of God's impartiality. He says, God shows no partiality to princes, nor regards to the rich more than the poor, for they are the work of his hands. So God don't see any partiality. 
I mean, that's, that's his nature. That's who he is. God's impartial for our salvation. He's impartial with our damnation. Let me tell you, that, 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 that salvation is open to all, so is eternal punishment. Peter said in 1 Peter 1.17, if you call on his Father as who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. We hear it preached. You read about it. And I think we, most part we all believe it. The final judgment is coming. There's going to be a day when everyone stands before God and gives an account to God. But, you know, there's a lot of people that scoff at that idea that we're not going to stand in front of in judgment in front of God. But you know what? The Bible clearly teaches it. It's going to be there. It's going to happen. That we're all, everybody's going to bow their knees. Jesus is Lord. That either here or, or there. One or the other. It's coming. And we're all going to stand in, in front of God and give an account for our sinfulness. Now, for those of us who have made Christ Lord of their life, for those who have repented of their sins and walked in righteousness, not because of our own right, but because of Jesus giving us that righteousness. You know, for those who are that, that, that judgment there, when we stand in front of God, when we stand in that courtroom, and Satan's reading off our sins, and we sit there and say, you know, and Satan says, you know, don't you, didn't you do all these? We have to say yes. God's going to do that, so he's going to condemn us because he cannot be around sin, but then we have that great advocate, don't we? We have that, that ace in the hole, and Jesus steps up and says, Father, they knew me. I know them. And God's going to declare us not guilty. But that don't mean that God's judgment doesn't show partiality. He, he's, not going to, he's not going to wave off sin. We cannot get there on our own. Now, to Jesus, or to God, that, that lie that we tell is the same as murder. That adultery that we commit is the same as stealing a pack of gum. It's the same. There's no partiality with God. It's across the board. His judgment is going to be based on what He sees, not what we see. And when He comes up and He, he says that, that, that every person, no matter about the race, no matter about your age, no matter how much you, you make or how much you, you do, it doesn't matter about any of that. Across the board, we're guilty. That is God's judgment against us. Every single person who walks on this faith of this earth is going to be standing in front of God who shows no partiality. It does not matter. That's his judgment. That's how he has to judge. That's how he's going to judge. Romans 3. 323 pretty much says it, doesn't it? For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't matter. I hope you get that picture. I hope you understand that we're going to get judged. Here, every single person. Second thing I want to see is God's judgment is coming. It is definitely coming. Not only is He partial about it, but it will come. I mean, I mean I'm sure. I, when we were younger, everybody in here has probably played hide and seek before, right? A lot of fun. You get to be it, and you've got to count to 100. <coughs> they get through count to 100, what would they say? Ready or not, here I come. It didn't matter if you were hidden. You couldn't have no do-overs. When they got to 100, you had to be either hidden, or you was going to be found and be tagged, and you was, you was going to be it. I uh, you know what? From that simple game... I want us to see that ready or not, judgment is coming. Whether we're ready or not, it doesn't matter. I mean, yes, yes, God puts off the slowness, not as we think of slowness, so everybody can repent and come to Him. God doesn't want to send anybody. Else. God doesn't want to want to do that. But that judgment one day is coming. You know, that judgment is a court decision. It, it's really to to make a formal decision between a dispute between two people, two parties. Uh, determine the rights and obligations of each party. God's judgment are decisions based on His truth in heaven. The will of God being done means that everything that is not His will will be judged. The purpose of God's judgment will be to show the true character of each person to publicly reward or punish each and every single one of us for our sins. 
to ultimately to vindicate the righteous character of God. One of the, I think, forgotten truths that we have as a church and as Christians that that is dismissed from God's word is that we're on a conclusion course with the Lord God Almighty. It is coming. I was going to work one one day. It's been a few years ago, and it, there was a been an ice storm, and there was ice on cars and stuff like that. I was I was falling behind this tractor and trailer, and a big chunk of ice pops off the back of this tractor trailer, you know. And, and I wanted to get over, but there was a car in this lane, and I knew whether or not if I tried to slow down or speed up, it wouldn't have mattered, you know. And I just could not escape this piece of ice. I mean, it. it and it came crashing down on my windshield, and it busted up, and, and, it went, and, it, and it went flying everywhere. You know, and it's just one of those where you just hang on, hoping that nothing happens. God's judgment's coming. We can't avoid it. It's going to be here. One day, that trumpet will sound. And I'm telling you what, we're going to be reminded of who God is. You know, you might think that he's... he's Full of love and grace and mercy, uh, he is. But let me tell you what, he's full of wrath and judgment too. And he is coming. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 44, that you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour we do not expect. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3, Paul says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as, will come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, the sudden destruction comes upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You know why God doesn't tell us when he's coming back? Because we'll live the way we want to live, won't we? If we knew the day that God was coming back, then people would just live the way they wanted to live and then get right with God on that last day. You know? Can you imagine the chaos in this world if people knew the day that God was coming back? how this world would actually be. There might be a few people out there living righteously and doing what's right. But for the most part, as decadent as this world is, you know, if we knew that day was coming, I guarantee it would be different on that last day than it would be the whole, the whole time coming. But God's judgment is looming. It's hanging over our heads. It cannot be escaped. And it can happen at any time. The question is, are you ready for it? How is he going to find you? He's going to find you and be able to come back and say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or, or is he going to come back and find you doing something you shouldn't be doing? Because ready or not, judgment is coming. You know, the thing is, if you've been truly born again, except Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you have lived right and worked on your own, you know, and you worked out your salvation with God, and, and you're prepared, and you're going to hear that. We're, going to, we're still going to get judged for our actions, but we stand in front of God knowing that we're in error with Christ. His judgment is coming. The last thing is, God's judgment is activated by rebellion. Activated by rebellion. I think most people think that a little rebellion is okay, or a little sin is okay. We do most of what God wants us to do, but not all of it. I think we talked a little bit about that last week with Saul and King Lamelack and, and how that he was that partial obedience still disobedience. God hates disobedience. He hates rebellion. It's, un it's important to think that we understand what rebellion has done to God's true desire for man. Look, Lucifer up in heaven, the first, the first sin of, uh, of rebellion against God, you know, and he came up against God. What happened? He got kicked out of heaven. We, we go right to Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve and, and told not you cannot eat from that tree. And just with a little bit of coaxing, the, the, the devil was able to get Eve to eat that apple, take a bite of that, and so was Adam. Not very much. What happened to them? They got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Man, we get in, in Numbers chapter 15. I want to look at another kind of rebellion. But, but, getting ahead of myself. But you know what we do? We do rebel against God. And I believe if we rebel, rebel against people here, as a student to your teachers, a wife from a husband, a husband, rebel against them, whatever, any type of rebellion we have in our life is really a rebellion to God. No matter what it is. If we rebel against the law, 
if we rebel, you're still rebelling against God. So I, I just want to look at this a couple things about rebellion here. We get in Numbers, like I said, chapter 15. And we see a man. We see a man on the Sabbath day collecting wood. Okay? This, this is what, what God told Moses to do. He said, Then the Lord said to Moses, The man surely shall be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones, just as the Lord had commanded him. Moses. You think that's a little harsh? He was a pick up some firewood. You know, maybe he was cold. He needs some firewood. But the law stood and stated that nobody was supposed to be working on the Sabbath. Nobody was supposed to be doing anything like that on the Sabbath. Because that day was set apart for God. And that's, that's the reason why. But man, that's just right, right on the heels of that, though. Man, we see. A guy named Korath, with about 250 other men, challenges Moses and Aaron's authority. God was mad. He wanted to wipe out all the Israelites. And, and, and Moses prayed for them. And, and he said, well, we'll do a test. And they light some censers in, in front of their tent. And, and Moses, Moses said, listen, you're going to know how. You're going you're to understand today who God really is. He says, if, if these men are, are vindicated in what they're doing, then God will do nothing. But if these men are wrong, and, and God has put Aaron and I in this position of leadership, then the earth will open up and swallow their whole families. No more, no, more, no more than the words came out of Moses' mouth. That the earth opened up and swallowed Korath. Family, him and his family and two other gentlemen in our family. See, what I want to see, well, first I'm glad we're not under any Old Testament guidelines. You know, uh, but, but I fully warn you, there is still a price to pay for your willful disobedience to God. There is a price to pay. It really is. First, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Rebellion is running rampant in our generation, in our nation right now. Unlike any before. And that rebellion activates God's judgment. No two ways around it. One day he's going to act on, on what's going on here in this world. So we have to understand, in closing, that God is watching. There's not a second of our lives that God has not seen. The good, the bad, and the ugly, it all has been numbered by God. We have been weighed by the scales of God, and we have been found guilty. Because none of us measure up to the perfect standards of God, no matter how hard we try or how hard we try to do, we will never be able to stand up for that. And then the fatal verdict is true forever. This is spelled out in Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. But I praise God that even though I'm rebellious and I'm his enemy, that he loved me enough to send his son because the rest of that verse says gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has replaced that fatal verdict with his son Jesus. And the judgment of God will be averted because of who Jesus is. For those of us who have made Christ Lord of their life, we don't have to worry about that final judgment. But there's going to be friends, family, people that we know that does not know Christ is Lord. And they're going to have that final judgment. And they're going to be cast into the lake of hell. Well, this is our party thought, as soon as this party over, I'll deal with what's going on. But he didn't have that chance. God is speaking to us today. We can't delay in responding to the writing on the wall. 
hope you're reminded of this passage in reality of God's judgment is impartial, that it is coming and activated by our, our rebellion. And we can speak that message of judgment to people that need to hear it. Ask your please to